He is the most wanted terrorist in the world. After almost a decade, US intelligence has finally tracked Osama bin Laden down to a compound in Pakistan. SEAL Team 6, a US elite special forces unit, is tasked with a now historic capture or kill mission. They had been waiting for this call for years. This is the inside account of one of the most famous black op missions of all times. It gets more excitement in the air and everybody starts getting a lot more serious. Boy, the helos, we're definitely going now. We're going in, it's going in at night. How SEAL Team 6 planned this high-risk raid and how it almost failed. Now on Black Ops, taking down Bin Laden. Operation Neptune Spear. Two Black Hawk helicopters carrying a team of US Navy SEALs are approaching a compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. They believe Osama bin Laden is hiding there. But then, disaster. It's rare an op ever goes like it's planned. There's always something that comes up without expecting it. One of the helicopters hits a sudden draft, causing it to hit the compound wall and crash land. The town's awake, and so they're thinking any minute now we can be run down with, you know, a lot of enemy forces coming at us. The SEALs have lost the element of surprise. Every second is now critical. The Special Forces team must quickly adapt and respond to the changed situation. What you're expected to do is make a determination whether the occupants are a threat or not a threat. They blow their way into the compound. And you have to react in an instant. Uh, if they're a threat, then you engage. This elite unit has trained for every scenario. This is the last chapter in the hunt to bring bin Laden to justice. A hunt which began more than a decade earlier. On 9-11, 2001, the US endures the worst attacks on its soil in modern history. Almost 3,000 people are dead. President Bush vows to hunt down Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda's leader and the mastermind of the attacks, and bring him to justice. There's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, wanted, dead or alive. In December 2001, US forces chase bin Laden to the caves of Tora Bora in Afghanistan, but he manages to slip away. We were always on the hunt. We were using every form of intelligence gathering, whether it was human intelligence, signals intelligence. For the next 10 years, bin Laden manages to elude US forces. We still haven't killed or captured Osama bin Laden and his terrorist cadre. Uh, do you happen to know where he is? He may be dead, he may be seriously wounded, he may be in Afghanistan, he may be somewhere else. Bin Laden learns very early on uh, that he can't trust anything electronic. He almost dies in Tora Bora in the mountains of Afghanistan from using cell phones. And so one of the first things he does is basically gets rid of anything electronic that could be traced back to him. Minimizing the use of communication technology allows Al-Qaeda's leader and his close deputies to operate under the radar. 
we saw his name crop up so little because very little communication. I think very few people in the organization knew where he was. Bin Laden seems to have disappeared off the face of the earth. The only clues come from videotapes he releases, taunting the US. You were looking at things as simple as the foliage and the, the, the light and the, the terrain to try and figure out where it may have been taped. Um, we looked at his health. Did he use particular words? Was it possible that what looked like just a sort of message to followers might have had some embedded message? Bin Laden has found a way to still control the organization. He basically becomes reliant on a series of uh, individuals, couriers in particular, who bring him information, uh, be it the latest uh, battle reports. They then in turn take his directives back out to his lieutenants in this way. Over the decade, the US does make some progress. Senior Al Qaeda figures are captured and interrogated. The importance of getting the big players in the organization, the archetypal plotters in the Al Qaeda organization, was partly trying to learn locational information. Where is the man? So the first question you might ask him might be things like, where's Bin Laden? Despite these successes, public enemy number one remains at large. By the time President Obama takes office in 2009, most people believe he'll never be caught. There are fewer, of course, fewer and fewer sightings of him. Bin Laden is making fewer videos, although still some. And when, we, when he does make a video, there's a spike in interest, of course, within the government. But at the CIA, some analysts are still looking for new clues. The bits and pieces are things like talking to detainees. How does the network operate? watching them move. Case officers suggest studying the structure of Al-Qaeda's network. Who does Bin Laden use to pass messages, allowing him to remain undetected? The analysts believe the answer to this question will lead them back to Bin Laden. Somebody says something here, somebody says something there. Over the course of years, you accumulate those grains and slowly a picture comes into focus. After years of frustration, the analysts believe they've got something. When we started looking at terrorist organizations, and if you look at them historically, they're not Western hierarchies. When you sit at the threat table, for example, you're talking about a facilitator here, a fundraiser there. The organization itself, as you go up to the top, they don't always talk to each other. It's very diffuse. It's more like fabric than a hierarchy. They knew there was probably a courier out there. And it was from some of these initial interrogations at Guantanamo Bay and other prisons that they learned of one courier in particular. Al-Qaeda's detainees reveal the courier bin Laden trusts is someone who's known as Al-Kuwaiti, the man from Kuwait. Digging deeper, they find his real name, Saeed Ahmed. If they find him, they may be able to find his boss. Through intercepts of his cell phones as he traveled throughout the Gulf and Pakistan, they figured out that he seemed to still be in touch with the highest ranks of Al-Qaeda, and they started tracking him on the ground in Pakistan. As they track him, CIA operatives notice a highly suspicious pattern to Al-Kuwaiti's behavior. They found this very strange thing he would do was to turn off his cell phone and then drop off the map for a while. Things that made the Americans think, this is the kind of extraordinary measure that the most hunted terrorist in the world might take. Let's follow this guy. The breakthrough comes when the agents manage to follow the courier's car. To their amazement, it is headed towards a residential compound in the outskirts of Abbottabad a Pakistani army town about an hour and a half drive from the capital, Islamabad. It's the home of Pakistani's West Point, one of its top military academies. It's a garrison town. The CIA starts watching the compound, 
Surveillance reveals that al Kuwaiti, the courier, lives there with his brother and their families. But they are not alone. Hidden behind unusually high walls, there are other residents, perhaps even another family, living on the top floor of one of the buildings. Once they had a place to focus on, you can bring kind of the full technological weight on this compound. And so there was really no expense spared. Satellites were shifted. You're basically using every technological mean, every covert mean on the ground. Initial analysis of the surveillance reports is encouraging. They still don't know who's in the compound, of course, in Abbottabad, but they suspect it's somebody quite senior, uh, either an al-Qaeda or one of the other terrorist organizations. Finding out who that mysterious senior person is will not be easy. Abbottabad was teeming with military officials, likely intelligence officials, security officials to protect the Pakistani military. So it was a very difficult operating environment. It's so difficult that at first, the CIA is focusing the effort on surveillance from space. You had satellites peering down. Uh, night and day, trying to get us uh, an image of whoever was working in there. You had electronic eavesdropping equipment that was trying to pick up any signals, be it emails, uh, text messages, cell phone conversations. And you had this new stealthy aircraft that was flying high over Pakistan, trying to get a glimpse of, again, who's inside. After weeks of satellite imagery, the efforts pay off. U.S. intelligence teams manage to identify a figure who occasionally takes walks around the courtyard, but appears to never leave the compound. The analysts are convinced they have found an HVT, a high-value target. They call him the Pacer. The Pacer is very tall. Bin Laden is about six foot four. It's a tantalizing clue, but any attempt to get closer and confirm it is indeed Bin Laden is fraught with risk. The challenge became, we think we have someone important here, but is it someone high enough on the ranks to risk a manned mission into the country that could completely upset the relationship with Pakistan for years to come? To try and confirm they have the right man, the CIA activates agents on the ground. They had a safe house overlooking the compound where they had Pakistani agents people spying for the CIA, trying to establish what they call a pattern of life. Who goes in? Who goes out? How many people live there? Who's interacting with the compound? There were women and children that would leave, come and go uh, from the compound. They would go shopping. Uh, the children, however, seemed to be mostly uh, stayed inside. But they never saw the individual, the tall individual, the pacer, as they called him. They never saw him leave the compound itself. So that raised even more suspicions. The agents soon report on the unusual behavior patterns of the residents. The house itself had no real connections to the outside world. There was a satellite dish, but there were no phone lines. There were no hard wires beyond some electricity wires going in and out. It's as if these people wanted to live off the grid. My first reaction when they described the compound in Abbottabad was that we had something that was very unusual. Neighbors say the compound's residents keep to themselves. Occasionally, they have visitors. Strangely, they burn their trash. In Washington, the analysts are still trying to determine who is the high-value target in the compound. But it's decided there is enough to brief the president. President Obama's top counterterrorism and intelligence officials go to him and say, look, we think we may have the location where bin Laden is right now. We can't be certain, but given all the other clues that we have, Obama is cautiously optimistic. This is by far the most solid lead they've had on the location of bin Laden in years. Once the intelligence reached a point where there was a, at least a higher confidence level about the possibility, uh, the next uh, question we asked was, what should we do operationally? A group of the president's closest advisors is called in to discuss the new lead. There are many questions on his mind. 
Are there military options? What are the diplomatic options? What are the political options here that I'm dealing with? And so he and his advisors begin talking about those kind of options, tasking the military and the CIA to come up with options of how you deal with this, assuming bin Laden's there. Officially, the Situation Room meetings don't exist. The top secret is shared only with a handful of people in the White House. Whenever they had these meetings at the White House, they weren't even put on the daily schedules that the top national security officials get. It's just a blank space in their calendars. There's a danger that if bin Laden is among the compound's residents, he may slip away before a plan is hatched. There may be escape routes or tunnels leading out of the compound. They have to act fast. CIA Director Leon Panetta wants to move things to the next stage. He calls in the commander of US Special Forces, Vice Admiral William McRaven. Bill McRaven is a bit of a legend in the community for a booming voice, a lot of charisma. His guys love him. He has always been hard charging, a good, clear thinker, and has always understood that modern warfare changes and special operations has to be flexible. McRaven oversees JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command. He wrote the book on black ops. He needs to come up with a plan. The machinery of intelligence and special operations has grown in the past decade plus. The world of counterterrorism operations, in fact, the world of joint operations generally, whether it's pirates or counterterrorism or cartels, is incredibly evolved. I think it's night and day from what we would have had back on 911. In the next weeks, his team will have to figure out if there is enough intelligence to go after the target. If so, what kind of an operation is feasible and which is the best unit to carry it out? McRaven is looking at what operatives on the ground found through surveillance, satellite imagery, and the analysis of communication intercepts. After reviewing the intelligence, McRaven is ready to present three options to the president and his team. The first option involves a massive bombing campaign by a B-2 bomber. The advantage of this kind of campaign would, it would be kill anybody in the compound. The downside, of course, was you'd never be sure bin Laden was ever there. Another option is a more surgical drone strike. They have proved effective against Al-Qaeda before. A couple of the senior advisors to the president were all for dropping a small munition, a missile, onto the compound. But others were arguing that there were a lot of civilians in the compound, women, children. That would produce many casualties. And a drone strike would still not guarantee knowing if they had actually killed bin Laden or not. Leaving just one other option. To ensure that you get the man that you're going after, you send in a commando team. This has the advantage, of course, that you can have eyes on your target. You can be guaranteed that he's killed or captured. This is a job made for an elite unit like the Navy SEALs. The public probably isn't aware how much the CIA and the Navy SEALs have worked together on missions across the world, uh, stopping Al-Qaeda, capturing Al-Qaeda suspects, sometimes killing them. They perfected this method of hunting a target, grabbing them, and then exploiting the scene, gathering up the evidence, taking it away. When it came time to get in the, the op for bin Laden, I mean, they were more than ready. They have more combat experience now than any unit in the world, and they've been fighting more than we've ever fought as a country. They've been doing a dozen raids a night next door in Afghanistan, and they've been doing it for years. So they had the skills, they were close by, and they've been hunting bin Laden for a decade. But planning an operation based on limited intelligence is risky. Even after months of concentrated efforts, there's no certainty that bin Laden is indeed in the compound. Rushing to action could needlessly cost the lives of dozens of US troops. 
What was the likelihood they were going to have to fight their way out? What was the likelihood of technical failure? And all of those things you've got to plan for, assess the risk against the potential gain. President Obama is facing the most momentous decision of his career. He needs to choose the best course of action. Bomb the compound from the air. Send in a black ops unit. Or maybe wait until he is sure bin Laden is there. The priority was to ensure that you either kill or capture Osama bin Laden. And the only way you could do that was to send in a commando team to do that job. As the president considers his options, one US special ops team is ordered to start preparing. Hand-picked for the job, they are the best of the best. The Navy's top secret counterterrorism force, SEAL Team 6. Well, historically, you know, people didn't talk about SEAL Team 6. The missions, the tactics, what they do, how they do it, it's all close-held secret. Inside the Navy, the unit is only known as Dev Group, short for Naval Special Warfare Development Group. Go, let's go, here's the out of here! There are 300 operators at SEAL Team 6. There's a team of a couple thousand people supporting them, everyone from intelligence to dog handlers to the boat and helicopter folks who get them into the mission. You can't really train all the other teams to quickly deploy to the jungle, quickly deploy to the desert or the Arctic or an urban. So you have one team made up of elite, of the elite who can deploy anywhere in the world. And that team really is our nation's 911 worldwide call. Only SEAL operators with years of experience are considered for a job with the team. You have to screen to become a part of SEAL Team 6. There's an additional years of training, of screening, of requirements that involve. McRaven knows he can rely on Team 6. He was once a commander with the unit and helped shape it as one of the best counterterrorism forces in the world. I think the thing that separates SEAL Team 6 from all others is SEALs just don't quit. They're trained never, ever quit. Over the last decade, US Special Forces have had a great deal of operational experience. Thousands of operations have been conducted. Many of them are not uh, in the front page, um, but almost all have had a significant influence on the direction of the war on terrorism. One of the few publicly known missions was the rescue of the captain of the Maersk, Alabama, from Somali pirates, who hijacked his boat near the Horn of Africa in 2009. The hostages were rescued, the snipers, you know, did their hit on the Somali pirates. But for every one that you hear about, there's a hundred successes you don't hear about. In Iraq and Afghanistan, nightly raids have been part of the SEALs' mission. They are ready for action. The SEALs got the go-ahead to start planning for this raid, and a small team worked on a model of the compound, figured out how they would go in, what was the best way to get everyone subdued, kill, capture? They were going to train and train and train and be ready if the president said, get on that plane and get to Pakistan. Not one of them breathed a word to their families or to their other SEAL teammates at SEAL Team 6. There's one real concern about keeping the mission secret. Should the US involve the Pakistani government? There are worries about trust. Over time, we saw problems working with Pakistani intelligence. Information going out the back door, for example, when we were cooperating with them. Too often, when they got a tip, it turned out that an hour before a raid, for instance, mysteriously, the target of that raid would disappear. He would have been tipped off. The president determines that bringing the Pakistanis in on the plan could mean losing the one chance in almost a decade to get Osama bin Laden. But keeping the Pakistanis in the dark makes this raid even more risky. This is crossing a border, crossing a large uh, 
territory of Pakistan, a sovereign country, without the knowledge of local security services, with the prospect that local police might get onto you and start shooting you in a Abbottabad, the risk factors here were incredible. The consequences of a potential disaster weigh heavy on the president and his aides. In the back of everyone's mind is the failed Desert One operation to rescue hostages from Iran in 1980. Eight American servicemen were killed when their helicopters collided on the way to the mission. It was a crushing blow for the Carter presidency. And some of those in the room with Obama are still haunted by what came to be known as Black Hawk Down, a special forces operation codenamed Gothic Serpent into Somalia in 1993. Militants shot down two US helicopters. At the end of the battle, 18 American soldiers were dead, their bodies mutilated and dragged through the streets of Mogadishu. These are his top advisors, people like Vice President Biden, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Defense Secretary Bob Gates, CIA Director uh, Leon Panetta, and they're all giving their assessments to the president. Some are more skeptical about this than others. Joe Biden, for instance, is a little more skeptical. Gates is, is skeptical about sending in ground troops. He's the one individual from this group who lived through uh, Desert One. Other intelligence officials, however, including Panetta, were much more bullish. Secretary of State Clinton, she was convinced that this was the right call to make, even though she lined up all of her doubts before saying, you know, we could be very wrong, we could end up with a bad relationship with Pakistan for a decade to come, but this is the right call to go in. It's a tough call. Whenever you're advising the president about a particular operation, it's how certain do you feel that your target's there and that you will have a good opportunity to successfully execute that mission versus what are the likely consequences or potential points of failure? To stack the odds in his favor, Obama orders additional backup. The president said, I want to be able to protect these guys and get them out. Within the White House itself, the top uh, national security aides, the president, and others were actually devising something they called the playbook. It was a three ring binder about two inches thick, and it was all the various contingencies of what could go right, what could go wrong, things in the middle. Uh, what would happen, for instance, if this Navy SEAL team, when it got in on the ground, was engaged by Pakistani soldiers or police? What would you do then? The president wants another SEAL team ready nearby as a quick reaction force. One thing that he personally wanted to see was the option to fight their way out if they had to. Uh, they didn't want to be pinned down. And so the military went back and devised some backup plans that had additional transport helicopters ready the chance that there might be a problem. Even now, the president still hasn't decided whether to green light the operation. But members of SEAL Team 6 are sent to prepare in North Carolina and in the Nevada desert. An exact replica of the compound is built, especially for them to train for every potential scenario. You could have landmines, or the whole building could be a, a trap. And the moment you get in the compound, you know, 4,000 pounds of explosives uh, gets detonated. You know, that's enough to kill the entire force. They know that they have a bunch of contingencies that they have to prepare for, and that plans don't always go according to plan. We have a saying, you know, plan you dive, then dive you plan. From the intelligence gathered, the SEALs learn that behind the high walls securing the compound are at least two buildings. The mysterious residence and the courier's brother seem to be in the main one. The smaller building has his al Kuwaiti and his family. To get to them, the SEALs would have to split into two groups. One will land in the courtyard and secure the perimeter, and the other will fast rope to the roof, taking the residents by surprise. Intelligence was critical. Our satellite imagery, our ground intelligence, 
uh, to the degree we could. We had an understanding of at least the, the battlefield exterior of the compound. As the SEALs prepare, the president calls in more experts. He wants fresh eyes on the intelligence, what the pros call a red team exercise. Senior analysts are given everything that's been gathered on the case. Their job is to provide an objective assessment of the intelligence. After reviewing the material, the red team concludes the chances bin Laden is in the compound are only 50-50. To get the 50-50 in itself, I thought was significant. That might seem lo like low odds for Vegas. For me as an intelligence professional, that's pretty good odds. In the last secret White House meeting, the room is still divided on the best plan of action. As they went around the table, each one of the participants basically is, is prefacing his or her remarks by saying, you know, Mr. President, we know this is probably the most difficult decision you're going to make. And of course, it got to be a joke as they went around, because they each echo each other, as if to kind of shield them from the ultimate responsibility of having to make this decision, knowing, of course, the commander in chief will be the one who decides whether to go or not. I think most of us would have said, the risk here is huge. And the best we could do is to say, boss, I'm going to have to ask you to take a huge risk. That said, I think I would have said, I'm not sure it's going to get any better. And now it's on your back. It's the ultimate decision for the commander in chief. Is he willing to risk the lives of American troops based on so much uncertainty? President Obama says he needs more time to think. But delay carries its own risk. What happens if you wait so long to have it be perfect that you lose the opportunity? The next morning, the president calls in his top advisors. He has made up his mind. Operation Neptune Spear is a go. It was the best information they were going to have. This was bin Laden, and this was the opportunity to strike, the opportunity they'd been looking for for years, uh, and the risks were worth it. The raid is planned for the next day, Saturday, April 30th, with Sunday, May the 1st, as an alternative if the weather is bad. As the SEALs prepare for the operation, the president continues with his planned commitments. The White House Correspondents' Dinner is scheduled for Saturday night. The president always attends it. This is an annual event here in Washington where the president shows up uh, in a black tie. He's usually subject, you know, he's expected to give a funny speech. All right, everybody, please have a seat. To make sure the operation remains a secret, everyone has to act as if it's business as usual. The White House advisors really debated do we pretend that the president is sick? Do we want him making jokes from the podium, which is the point of that particular dinner, just as the raiders are hitting the compound? What if the helicopters go down? What if you have another Black Hawk Down situation where you lose a, a whole team? At the last minute, forecast for cloudy weather delays the mission by 24 hours. Seven p.m. in Jalalabad, Afghanistan. It's a moonless night. Two Black Hawk helicopters take off from a U.S. airbase. Each is carrying 12 members of Navy SEALs Team 6. The operation to get Osama bin Laden, codenamed Neptune Spear, is finally underway. Boy, this is a little hairy here. OK, we are flying in the packs, and yet this is a goal. This is definitely a goal. And then the, it gets um, more excitement in the air, and everybody starts getting a lot more serious. We're definitely going now. We're going in. It's going in at night. On the tense flight to Abbottabad, the troops go through last-minute preparations. And there'll be a very detailed patrol leader's order. It's time you're going in, time you're coming out, what gear you're going to take, who's going to be sitting where in the helos. These SEALs were hand-picked for the mission because of their specialities and experience. It's the operation they've long been waiting for. 
you're going through the what ifs. You know, what if we get fire upon upon infiltration? What if what if the fast rope is in the wrong spot? You know, what if what if we we get around and, and the helicopter you know is downed outside the compound where now you need to protect not only the the pilots. You know, where are you going to move them into? You know, you're you're kind of going through your your playbook. The troops also find time for a personal moment. And the air is so, so thick. Uh, people are saying last minute prayers and thinking about the families and uh, making sure the weapons are loaded, doing press checks, making sure there's a round in the chamber, making sure all the gear is secured, going over last minute notes with the buddies, thinking of all the details. Also on board the aircraft, a translator, and a dog named Cairo, member of the canine unit. If for anti-personnel and sniffing things out. Let's go search something for smell, looking for somebody. Cairo was a veteran, a veteran of many raids. He'd actually been wounded in a previous raid and had taken six months out to recuperate. The SEALs are flying in new stealth helicopters, specifically designed for this mission. The SEALs have the state-of-the-art equipment, and every year and every generation, the helicopters get a little faster, a little lighter, a little harder to detect. The operation pilots are the Night Stalkers, members of the Army's elite 160th Special Aviation Regiment. We're called Night Stalkers for a reason. We tend to like to fly at night uh, to give us the cover of darkness. Flying in the dark is a lot different than flying in the day. And, and sound acts differently. Light obviously acts differently. The whole mission is planned to hit the target from an unexpected direction and at an unexpected time. Journey to the target in Abbottabad takes about 90 minutes. The two stealth helicopters manage to cross the border to Pakistan undetected. You're going to have uh, uh, you know, weather radar so you can detect, you know, storms uh, or uh, electrical storms uh, that could be on the horizon. You're going to have weapons, um, and these weapons are generally not found in the, in the conventional army uh, inventory. So these are spe specifically designed to get onto an objective. A lot of the aircraft today have uh, long-range fuel probes so they can air do aerial refueling. In the original plan, they were going to fast rope down into the outer courtyard. It would have taken two minutes to land these guys, and maybe 10 minutes in all to storm both buildings. Just as he's hovering above the compound, preparing to land, one of the pilots hits serious trouble. The air was hotter than anyone had expected, and the Helicopter lost control because the air was thinner and the helicopter therefore was heavier and started falling a little bit through space, sliding greasily back and forth. Drones flying over the compound stream the unfolding disaster back to Vice Admiral McRaven in Jalalabad, the CIA headquarters in Langley, and to the Situation Room in the White House. They're all like jammed in a very small kind of room, listening, watching the feed. All they could see is the helicopter going down and then crashing and wondering, have we just lost the mission? With one helicopter down and the loss of the surprise element, the SEALs will have to quickly adapt to the situation or the whole operation could be compromised. It landed upright just landed a little hard. We call that a, you know, an uncontrolled landing or a, or a hard impact landing. And in that case, you know, it became mechanically impossible for that aircraft to take off. In the Situation Room, the tensions are running high. Your heart's in your throat. You don't know at any moment if the Pakistanis are going to come rushing in. You don't know if you're going to hear that the whole mission has been lost. The White House advisors are desperate to hear if the SEALs survived the crash. An extremely tense moment until they heard from McRaven, no, the guys are out, the guys are good, 
and we're prepared for this, we're modifying the plan. When Admiral McRaven indicated a kind of, you know, this is not a problem, these guys are gonna do the job, it gave me a sense of confidence. In Abbottabad, the pilot buries the nose of the helicopter in the ground. If failure's not an option, you have to have a way to, uh, to accomplish the mission. One thing that's critical to the success is imaginative operators on the ground and people that can shift gears. The SEALs immediately activate Plan B. When uh, things go wrong, uh, you're not going to overreact. You have a checklist, and you can get through just about anything. They quickly organize themselves to storm the compound from the ground. The first thing the guys have to do is get a full head count, make sure everybody's there. But the crash has caused noise. The town's awake, and so they're thinking, any minute now we can be run down with you know, a lot of enemy forces coming at us. Fearing they've lost the element of surprise, they know every second is now critical. And once you're at the door, the door's got to be breached. As soon as the door's breached, people are in, left, right, left, right, left, right, and then you make movement. Can't work. The SEALs make it to the courtyard. Now they must get to the main building where they think Bin Laden may be. There were these knots of children who were trying to avoid getting caught, trying to avoid getting hit, and not knowing what to do or where to run. They still don't know who else is in the compound and how many people are armed. And they're just moving, moving, going through danger areas, moving, 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 checking stairways, clearing so people can go up stairways. When someone opens fire, they engage. <gasps> With still no sign of Bin Laden, the SEALs move to clear the next building. They find that most entrances and pathways are barricaded or blocked. The key is to have the standard operational procedures that allow a unit to flow through a structure like that, keeping a target in mind, keeping security in mind. They get a closed door, they know to get security on it, people blast through the door. From his headquarters in Langley, CIA Director Leon Panetta is narrating the action for the president. We had heard that shots had been fired. We really weren't quite sure what, you know, what was happening. It was a good 15 or 20 minutes of uh, silence in the sense of what exactly was going on. They are inside the main building. The young man they've just shot matches the description of Bin Laden's son. They advance up the stairs, leading to the top floor. Osama Bin Laden pokes his head around the doorway. One of the first SEALs in the line knows that's Bin Laden. The operational signal for sighting their target is sent to the command, Geronimo. The signals were set out by alphabet, A, B, C, D. G was securing Osama Bin Laden, G for Geronimo. They gun down Bin Laden with a signature double tap. One shot to the chest and one to the head. In the Situation Room, it was, we got him, we think, wait, maybe, we hope. Those were very long and tortuous moments, waiting for the word. They move in to confirm they got the right man. A message is sent back, EKIA, enemy killed in action. One of them pushes Bin Laden's widows out of the way. 
He has to assume they may be wearing suicide vests. One of the women is bleeding from gunfire ricochets. They collect DNA samples. The SEALs started evidence collection, taking photographs of bin Laden's face and sending those back so that two waiting teams in the CIA who were facial recognition experts, measuring the length of the nose, the length of the jaw. The operation is not complete. Bin Laden was running Al-Qaeda from the compound. The evidence he left behind could be used to prevent future attacks. It took them 19 minutes to get to Bin Laden, and then in the rest of the time, they were going from room to room, looking for computers, cell phones, documents, anything that might tell them what Bin Laden had been doing there for the past six years, and anything that might lead them to other parts of the network. But every minute they spend gathering material puts the teams at greater risk. One of the helicopters positioned nearby makes its way to the compound to assist in evacuating them. We have everybody. We have the aircraft that we're exiting on the right route. Before taking off, one team blows up the crashed helicopter, making sure its classified design features and technology will not fall into the wrong hands. In the early morning hours, the SEAL teams finally make it back to Jalalabad. Before being taken away, Al-Qaeda's leader is identified with almost 100% certainty. Hours later, his body will arrive at the USS Carl Vinson, and bin Laden will be given a burial at sea. The White House team is getting ready to announce the news to the world. America's number one most wanted terrorist is dead. When the helicopters got back over the border into Afghanistan and it dawned on the people inside the Situation Room and the top CIA officials that they've done it, looks like we've got bin Laden and all the SEALs and all the teams supporting them safely out, that's when people quietly started popping the champagne bottles. Good evening. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda, and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. When President Obama goes to congratulate the SEALs who took part in the mission a few days later, the question of the identity of the SEAL who shot bin Laden comes up. They collectively answer, we all did, sir. The team then hands the president an American flag with an inscription saying, Operation Neptune Spear, May 1st, 2011, for God and country, Geronimo.